What's going on, everybody? No Huddle Show. We're back. Training camp is back. And good news, guys, Matt's back. <laughs> Elliot, it's good to be back. It's good to be back here at NovaCare. And I don't know about you, but I always get excited about training camp. And this year, with all the new additions over the offseason, it really is no different. And you know he's excited because he was in Hawaii. So <laughs> needless to say, the NovaCare is nice. They've done some changes to it. But Hawaii, probably a little nicer. A little bit. And, uh, still coming off of island time. But <laughs> certainly getting right back into football mode. And seven on sevens on day one. It's, it's, it's nice to kind of ease back into it before all the veterans get here and the coaches have a chance to look at these rookies for the first couple of days. All right, well, before we get into what we saw today, and even though it was a two-hour practice and no no contact, they did have the pads on, but let, let's do a little house, uh, little house clean first. So this is a no-huddle show. Um, if you're listening to us, wherever you're listening to us, we're, we're lots of places. We're on iTunes, on the App Store, we're on Stitcher, we're on SoundCloud, we're on iHeartRadio, we're on Google Play, and we're on Spreaker. So you can check us out all those places. If you're listening to us in an internet browser, don't be lazy. Go somewhere and just you know subscribe. You'll get the latest episodes quicker. And we're going to be doing a ton more of these. Matt, I talked about this in the last podcast, yep. but... We kind of, you know, we had like a little bit of a hiatus, but it's a new season. We're going to try doing a lot more of these, maybe two, three times a week. We're having players on. As you can tell, Joe Giglio is not here, but we're going to be having him on. Then also a lot of times he was going to do episodes by himself and talk to guests for, you know, half hour, 40 minutes, some extended one-on-ones. I did a little bit of that last week with Jalen Mills. Matt, I know you're going to do it. So. I have some in the pipeline that I think people are going to be excited about. Players, experts across the NFL. Mm-hmm. And guys, this really is the place to be, whether it's the No Huddle Show, whether it's following Elliot on Twitter, myself on Twitter. This is really your one-stop shop for all the Eagles news and analysis at NJ.com, No Huddle Show, the whole That's deal. Right. All right, cool. So now that we got that out the way, let's talk about practice. So. It's Monday, first day of training camp. Even though it's the first day, no veterans. It was literally only Wentz. The notable guys were Wentz and Derek Barnett and Ron Brooks, I guess. But outside of that, it was mostly rookies. Um, I know even though it was kind of a – I don't want to say lackadaisical practice. I know there was still a lot of takeaways from me, but Matt, let's start with you. What did you really notice today? I think, Elliot, today was really, and the next two days are going to be the same thing before the veterans get back in here. It's really the coaching staff's chance to kind of get the rookies back together, see how much yeah. they remembered from the spring, see how much they can build on from the spring, and really fine-tune these guys while they have the chance to get them basically one-on-one before the vets get in here. But two or three players, and I wrote about this on the site, two guys that really stuck out to me were – Corey Clement and okay. Greg Ward, the wide receiver, yeah. made a highlight reel one-handed catch Ward did in the end zone. And Corey Clement, a guy who I think might have an outside chance to unseat Wendell Smallwood as this team's number four running back. Yeah, let, let's talk about both those guys sure. first before we go ahead and them. So sure. Corey Clement, he's an interesting guy to me, yep. as you said. I mean, outside shot, had they not signed LeGarrette Blunt. I think his chances would be a lot better because even though he's smaller than Blunt, and let's be honest, like every running back in the NFL is, yep. but even though he's smaller than Blunt, he is a between-the-tackles runner. He's a guy that will get you those tough yards, and if Blunt's not on the roster, I don't know where the Eagles get that from. And even more so, I think that what we saw today and a little bit of what we saw when he was at Wisconsin was you get him in space on the outside in the passing game, he's got some elusiveness out yeah. there. He's got some the speed out there. The issue for him there. is just catching it. Absolutely. <laughs> and he did that today, obviously, against rookie defensive backs, but that was impressive for me because he was a guy that I thought really had an uphill battle to right. make the roster. And now I, om- and I know it's only one practice and you don't want to make too much of it, but I almost feel like it comes down to him or Wendell Smallwood for that final roster spot. And bare minimum, I think he has a chance at the practice squad. Well, and the interesting part about that is him versus Wendell Smallwood. So Smallwood last year, obviously he wasn't a practice today because he's not a rookie. But last year, fifth round pick, he wasn't selected by Joe Douglas. And I think we can both agree Joe Douglas has a ton more say than we think he used to. Yep. So I think, you know, this isn't the Howie show like I thought it would. Joe Douglas is going to have some say. So the fact that Joe Douglas didn't draft Wendell Smallwood is, to me, a bad sign for Smallwood. Outside, So him versus Clement, I think Clement does have a shot to, to take him out. I do too, and I think that he's going to need to build on practices like today where he can show that not only can he be that between-the-tackles runner, which they already have in LeGarrette Blunt, right. but he can also be that little bit of a dual threat because you look at someone like Donnell Pumphrey, another rookie, somebody they invested a, a fifth-round draft pick in. Pumphrey's a guy who's primarily a pass catcher. You're not going to see him carry the ball all that mm-hmm. often out of the backfield. And given that this is, in all likelihood, Darren Sproles' last year or second to last year on the roster, it'd be nice for them to have that luxury of Clement if he can step up and be that dual threat guy behind Blunt and behind Sproles. Well, the thing is, too, like, so Smallwood last year, he had the kick return. 
Yep. Um, he is a kick returner. I mean, they didn't bring Kenyon Barner back, so they're going to need someone for that. They, I have not seen them have Clement do too many kick return catches or punt returns. So I'm not sure if that's a role they see him in. But if you look at the running back depth chart, obviously Blunt's a lock. Darren Sproles is going to make the team and Donald Pumphrey. So that fourth guy is not going to see the field a ton on offense. So then it comes down to special teams. That is one place I think Smallwood has the advantage. I agree. And the other question is, and that, you know, we'll talk about this a lot over the next five weeks, who can they get onto the practice squad? Because if they cut one of them, ideally you would think they would want to have maybe one on the practice squad. So I think you have a better chance of getting Corey Clement on the practice squad. He went undrafted. Yep. yep. Um, and also – you don't need him because Blunt's here. But Blunt's on a one-year deal. So if Clement uh, is here for a year, you teach him. I think maybe going for the future, he could be a good guy. But I agree with you, this idea that he you know, he can take Smallwood out. I don't think that is a 0% chance. And, and I think it's interesting. Obviously, it's the first day of camp, and we're going to talk a lot about guys like Clement and guys like Pumphrey and some bottom-of-the-roster players. But I, I really think, as you do, that this could be a battle. And it was one of the five battles that I wrote about going into the camp getting underway. One of the five battles I'm going to keep an eye on because right. I think that they're going to give Clement and Smallwood, if not equal reps, they're going to give Clement a chance to lock down that final spot. I agree. And I also think Deuce Staley, I don't think, I'm just going to say, I don't think he's the biggest Wendell Smallwood fan. And I think Clement's a guy that he probably had more of a say about bringing in. So I would say Deuce, the running backs coach, is probably more excited about what Clement brings than Smallwood. Um, another thing is, before we move on, is these are two guys when we need the pads to go on to really see them. That's yep. where Corey Clement will really shine. In theory, Smallwood should look good. He's got a full year under his belt. I think yeah, I agree with you. That is one of the more interesting camp battles. So the other player you mentioned that I think stood out today on Monday was Greg Ward, um, a guy that in these six weeks since we last saw these players, I thought he had like a 0% chance of making the team. Wasn't even sure it was practice squad material. I mean, uh, last year the Eagles brought in David Watford, a college quarterback, who they tried to transfer, uh, turn him into a receiver. And he's back again this he's year. He's back again this year. And I just think when you look at those two guys, Greg Ward versus Watford, Watford's so much bigger. I think he looks more like a dominant receiver. That being said, Greg Ward today might have been the best receiver out on the field. Now, granted, it's just rookies, but he had a, num- he had a ton of good catches in 7-on-7. Seven seven. He had the highlight of the day, as you mentioned, the one-handed catch. So the question is, let's go, let's go through the receiver depth chart sure. real quick. So we can, we can agree Alshon's a lock. Yep. Torrey Smith, 99%. I think he's pretty close to lock. I know that you think that there's a little bit of leeway. And we'll see the yeah, contract I, is structured I just think that any time, get out. Yeah, right. anytime there's zero guaranteed dollar in a contract, it's hard for me to say you're a complete lock. But we'll, we'll, we'll definitely put him on. So Alshon, Torrey Smith, Jordan Matthews barring a trade, Aguilar barring a trade. Those are four guys. Matt Collins is definitely going to be yep. here. So that's five. Last year, the Eagles kept five receivers. Um, so they have, that very well could be the five. We might not even be talking about a six spot. That's where I think, that as far as Ward goes, while it's nice to see him have the kind of practice he had today and make the kind of circus catches that he's been making today and during mm-hmm. the spring, it's just a bit of a numbers game for right. him because there is suddenly so much depth there at wide receiver. And we're going to talk about a lot about Shelton Gibson and not for particularly great right. reasons throughout the course of this podcast based on what he's done in the spring and some tr- worrisome trends that continue today. But you look at the fact that they invested a draft pick in Hollins, Mac Hollins, that is, a draft pick in Gibson. I almost give both of those guys an upper hand over Ward at this point. Oh, yeah. But he's a guy that you might be able to sneak onto a practice squad similar to what they've tried to do in the past. Yeah, so Greg Ward, I mean, just to be honest, I think he has basically a 0% chance of making the roster. Yep. Barring, you know, a three or four guys getting injured. So we're talking about practice squad here. I think, you know, the five guys we mentioned are the top five. Uh, Shelton Gibson, we'll talk about in a minute. That's six. You can make an argument for Mar- uh, Marcus Johnson seventh over over Ward. So I do think he has an uphill battle. But over Paul Turner as well. And, yeah. and Bryce Treggs had been here. Right, we'll exactly. See what happens there. Right. No, it's a very good point. I forgot about them. So th- those are the guys that are, he's fighting against. I think maybe practice squad. And the funny thing to me is with fans, they always think, all right, well, this guy, if you cut him, he's not going to get through to practice squad. 99% of the times – you know, every year it seems to have come to the team. The Eagles are Eagles fans are afraid they're going to cut someone, and the guy's not going to make the practice squad. They almost always make it to practice squad. So if Greg Ward is cut, if he has a really good training camp, I think that he will be on the practice squad. Maybe he takes Watford's spot. Watford was on the practice squad last year, but I, I agree. I mean, if we're talking about just Monday's practice, I think he was kind of the winner of the day in terms of doing the most uh, to help his roster spot. So let's move on. Shelton Gibson. Uh, not a good day. I mean, look, you you were 
you missed the last two podcasts, but uh, things I've talked about, I know we've talked about this on the sideline. Yep. Sheldon Gibson just can't catch the ball. He's having a lot of trouble holding onto the ball, and I know that's a sensitive subject for Eagles fans after last year. And if Gibson's going to make the team, the one thing he can't do is have issues with drops. He's swimming, and he's yeah. been swimming all spring. And it's kind of funny because when you look at his tape at West Virginia, drop passes weren't really a Mm-mm. problem for him. But I think what's happened was – the speed of the game from playing in the Pac-12 or the Big 12, rather, to stepping up to the NFL, I think that's kind of been a difficult transition for him. And in terms of mastering the playbook and getting his confidence and his feet underneath him, it's been a struggle. But when you go through the OTAs and you go through the mini camp and you get through the spring and you're struggling with drops and you get to day one of training camp and you're dropping passes and your head coach steps to a podium and says that he's nowhere near where we need him to be. And that's what Doug said today. Doug said that today. Yeah. That, that's a really worrisome situation for a kid like Sheldon Gibson, particularly at a position where we were just talking about, Ellie. You have a group of veterans, but then you have some kind of unsung young players who are outperforming him. Yeah. It, it really sets him up for if he doesn't turn this thing around quick, he might not even make it to final cuts. Yeah. Even though I think the fact that they invested a draft pick in him get, buys him a little bit of time. That hourglass is going to run, run out pretty quick if you can't figure out how to hold on to the football. Yeah, so I do. Th- I, I think he will make it to final cuts. Um, so Doug said that today, as you said, that he wasn't, you know, Gibson's not where the team wants him to be. I talked to Gibson in the locker room today after practice, and he agreed. And I asked him, why are you dropping the ball? And he said it was confidence. So he said, you know, being away these last six weeks has helped his confidence. He even said, like, when I go back home, I'm the man, and it makes me feel good. Well, he dropped passes today, too, so that, that new confidence was short-lived. Um, I do think he makes it to final cuts, and it, you know, the fact he's a fifth-round pick really helps him because yep. I was looking it up. I don't think the Eagles have cut a fifth-round pick since 2010. No, I don't think he's going to get cut, but I think that if, if things don't get dramatically better well, I think and somebody he might like get cut. Ward outplays him right. or, or Watford steps up or somebody gets cut out there that the Eagles just had their eye on in the draft and somehow they snuck right. loose during cuts, I, I think he still has a good chance of making this team, but I don't think that his roster spot is anything – close to being locked up at this point. It's not a lock. I mean, and I don't think he has a good chance of making the team. I I think he is that sixth receiver right now, but the things going against him are one, they didn't keep six receivers last year. And when you, when we go through our 53 man predictions, there's positions where they're going to need to keep guys simply because they don't have a lot of answers there. Cornerback, you might need to keep somebody extra just in case defensive line positions like that. Sneaking six receivers on the roster I'm not sure Gibson is worth that, especially when he's not going to, he's more than likely not going to contribute on special teams. So I think he's the sixth guy. I think, you know, not, not to uh, ride the fence. I think it really is 50 50 at this point. Sure. But, but if you would have told me, I mean, look, the day they drafted him, I tweeted, I think he has a shot to start week one. And the reason I thought that was because in college, he averaged 22 yards a catch. This team badly needs a deep threat. I'm not completely sold on Torrey Smith as a deep threat. So Gibson was exactly what they needed. I thought he was a great pick in the fifth round. But people fall to the fifth round for a reason, and we're seeing in camp why now I don't think he's going to be starting in week one, obviously. But I, I don't think his, his roster spot is completely locked up. So, no, I, I agree. Uh, and I think the other thing that neither one of us factored in, because I wrote the same thing the day after the draft, that the rookie that would have the biggest impact this season would be mm-hmm. Shelton Gibson for all of the reasons you outlined. But the one other thing that I don't think either one of us saw back in April was this dynamic spring from Nelson Aguilar. Yep. And obviously Aguilar hasn't checked in here yet, but the kind of spring where he was just catching everything thrown his way, he looked faster he looked stronger and maybe most importantly he looked more confident he's now in my opinion pushing Jordan Matthews and making Matthews a bit expendable for a potential trade I, which yeah, I don't they, disagree with you if that. they get Aguilar to continue to perform at this level under new wide receiver coach Mike Grow, then that further is going to put Sheldon Gibson behind the eight ball because Aguilar along with Doriel Green Beckham who has since been released right. Aguilar was one of those bubble guys who has now played his way into a potential starting job. Yeah and Aguilar is definitely a guy I'm excited to see on Wednesday when the full squad gets here. Before we move to that though let's talk about the cornerback position yep. today. So the real only Two, two things to the cornerback position stood out for me today. The first was Rasul Douglas. Um, again, like when I see this guy, he's just so much physically bigger than the rest of the cornerbacks. 6'2", I think he's 2'10", maybe, somewhere around there. He's a big guy, long arms, very physical. I thought he looked good today. You know, 
not a practice. He, and especially, it's good for him to look good in this type of practice because he should be better when the pad's gone. He's a physical yep. player. I thought he looked good today. Um, the second thing, though, to me, and again, talking about the 53-man roster, Ron Brooks being out there. Yep. You know, two, three months ago, when I was looking at the cap situation, the potential 53-man roster for next season, I didn't even factor Ron Brooks in because I thought he might be a cap casualty. He had the season-ending quad injury last year. And I know we disagree with this on li- a little. You think he played better than I do last year, but he was still – He's still one of their best options on the roster right now, no matter how you slice it. So him being out there today, um, he looked good. Um, I saw him, you know, this sounds silly, but I saw him, you know, running and jumping and just not no signs of an injury. Broke up a couple passes yep. when the was in the mix on a couple plays where he was double teaming Rasul, with Rasul Douglas against a wide receiver and seemed to be around the ball again. Yeah. And it was interesting during Doug Peterson's press conference today, he basically came out and said, obviously, Ron Brooks hadn't been healthy during the spring when we got a first glimpse of how the depth chart might right. be shaping up. But Doug said today that as of now, Ron Brooks is the nickel corner. So that's a little bit of break news today right. and then certainly underscores what you saw today and what I saw out on the practice field with Brooks and I think that at least in the beginning of the season while you're bringing along a Rasul Douglas and you don't want to put too much on his plate maybe you leave Jalen Mills on the outside opposite of Patrick Robinson rather than yo-yoing him back and forth if mm-hmm. Ron Brooks can be that nickel corner it allows Mills to focus in on playing on the yeah. outside you don't have it to allows move Jenkins down from safety correct it mm-hmm. allows Jenkins to play deep safety and he can kind of focus Focus in on that role alongside Rodney McLeod. So if, if Brooks is healthy and effective, that's all the better for this secondary. And yeah. on Rasul Douglas, I thought he played well today, but I also thought he got a little handsy. I thought, saw okay. a couple plays where he might have got a handful of the jersey of Gibson or the handful of the jersey of Hollins. And that's the one thing back in the spring I remember Corey Udenland kind of screaming at him about, like, yeah. you know, leave your hands off him, take your hands off him. And while he's physical, while he's aggressive, while he has great ball skills, and those are the things that you and I and they think the Eagles really like about Rasul Douglas, I think that's one thing that he's going to need to work on throughout this camp is – not to be quite so grabby yeah. because you're going to draw pass interference penalties and offensive coordinators and quarterbacks are going to key in on that pretty and that, quick. I mean, that's where the speed comes in. Yep. You know, because if he's behind, it's it's almost human nature to try to grab right. the guy to slow down. And speed was not his thing at West Virginia. I mean, he did not play a lot of man-to-man. He did not get up on the line of scrimmage a lot. And that, to me, is the biggest issue coming in. So, you know, we'll see how he adjusts to that. So the cornerback position, we went through this a bit with the receiver. Let's do it with cornerback. So Jalen Mills, we can agree, is a lock to make the roster. Yep. Rasul Douglas, locked to make the yep. roster. Patrick Robinson, again, he kind of, to me, falls in the Torrey Smith thing of zero guaranteed money. Um, he doesn't have as big of a cap savings. He's only a million bucks in cap savings, whereas Torrey Smith would save you four and a half. Um, so I think he's pretty close to a lock. But so those are your three guys. Uh, the fourth guy, I guess, now is Ron Brooks. I think yep. we can basically say, barring a setback, he, he's going to be that fourth guy. I think he's a lock at this point. So, so there are your five right there. Um, I mean, sorry, you're four right there. Now the question is, who's the fifth guy? To me, a sh- it comes down to two people, unless I'm forgetting someone, C.J. Smith and Aaron Grimes. I think those are your candidates to be the fifth guy. Do you think they keep six cornerbacks? To start the year, I think those are your two candidates, but I wouldn't be shocked if Sidney Jones plays. I would, and, I would be shocked. You'd be more surprised <laughs> than I would. I think that there's a chance he could play – late in the season in November or so if he's healthy. Is but, it Well, while we're talking about the rookies, let's talk about that. I mean, sure. let's say Sidney Jones is 100% medically cleared. It's week 13. Is, he, is it worth putting him out there at that point? Throwing him into the fire. I think we both agree this team is at, the le- is at least going to be in the conversation for the playoffs. If they're in time. the mix, I think you get him out there because you want your best players on the field. And he was a second-round pick. a big adjustment. Pick. It is, but we can look at it both ways. You can look at it as he might not be in complete game shape. You might right. look at it as that he has fresh legs and he's not as banged up as some of the mm-hmm. corners are because he's been rehabbing and he's not taking the hits and the wear and tear of games and practices all the way back to August. But yeah. If they're in the mix, if it's week 13 and he's medically cleared and he's been, you know, doing individual work and he's been in meetings, I think you have to throw him out there. And and I know that it was an Achilles injury and that could really, you know, hamper a guy's speed, particularly at that position. But if he's ready to go... I, I think you got to throw him out there. So it just comes down to how quickly can he get back fully healthy? He's already out of the boot. He's on the NFI. He's not going to take part in training camp. Mm. But if we get 12, 13 weeks into the season and he's cleared, 
I, I'd be real tempted to throw him out there. To me, it's not even about the physical thing. It's, I mean, and Shelton Gibson said it today. You know, I asked him, why is he dropping passes? Confidence. If I'm yeah. thinking of Sidney Jones, and don't get me wrong, I don't think he's a guy that's going to struggle with confidence. Um, that's what you heard about him at Washington. So, yep. But I just think, you know, you put him out there. It's, you know, you're playing divisional opponents down the road, big games. If he does not – let's say he plays the final four games of the year. First of all, I don't think you can expect almost anything out of him in those final four games. If he doesn't play well, though, you know, then there's a lot of talk going into next season about his struggles, and he has to live with that. I'd almost rather give him the full off season, a, a full NFL offseason, like being a red fully healthy. Here. Right. I Like, you know, I don't I don't think redshirting him would, would be the worst thing in the world. I think even though – they are weak at cornerback, and we agree on that. I think that th- that is the best thing to do with him. So if we assume he's going to start on the pup, we got the five guys we talked about. C.J. Smith is a guy to me. was here last year. He ended the season on the active roster. Um, Aaron Grimes might have made the team last year, if not for – I think it was a shoulder injury in yep. training camp. Those are the two guys I think – that have the best shot of getting that final cornerback spot. Now, n- neither come I, till Wednesday. So, right, you no, know, I, I agree. And I was just going to say that we talked a little bit about how Douglas was getting a little grabby with his hands during OTAs and minicamp. And I remember on that last practice of minicamp, Corey Underland basically sat him down and put Aaron Grimes mm-hmm. in as the first team cornerback. And he got a lot of reps in those final two days of the three day mandatory minicamp. So if it comes down to Smith or Grimes, and I know that. They were both here, and they were both, you know, in the building last year. I think that Grimes might have a little bit of the upper hand in that battle. But, look, we haven't even gotten to the full first full practice of training camp right. or the preseason games well, yet. Well, speaking of the first full practice, let's talk about Wednesday a little bit. Yep. Um, we'll do a little preview for that. So, I'm sorry, I, I keep saying Wednesday. The first team full practice is on Thursday. My apology. So, on Thursday, the full team's here. All the veterans, we're assuming everyone's going to report. I'd be pretty surprised if anybody didn't. So, we're going to have all 89 players at this point, I think they're at. What are you looking forward to? No, not looking forward to. What are you going to be watching the most on Thursday? Because I know, I know for me, what the first thing my eyes are going to check is. Let me, let me see if you agree. Or not. The first thing for me is going to be the timing with Wentz and Alshon Jeffrey. Okay, that, that's what I want to see. I want to see how Jeffrey and Wentz, because they built a, a pretty instant connection during the spring, and mm-hmm. especially in the end zone, we saw some deep balls thrown his way. I want to see that timing continue to get better. Okay, so that was not mine. Mine was. I want to see when the first team offense goes out there who's going to be at that left guard spot. Yeah. I think, you know, Alan Barber was injured to start OTAs, so he was not a part of it. But they had Isaac Samalu out there, a guy that, frankly, I don't think is as good as people think. I know the Eagles want Eagles him. Eagles are to, high on Eagles him. Eagles are very high yep. on him. But how he's been high on a lot of guys that haven't worked out. So I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't think that means much to me. Um, they had Samalu in there at left guard to start the OTAs and minicamps. But once Barber was back, he was it was at least 50-50, if not more. And I think there's a lot to be said for having the same five guys start for you as you did last year. I think the offensive line played well last year. I think having Barber in there is is the better option. So I'll be interested to see, you know, I think the best man will play, but I think Samalu has kind of like the political advantage. I think this is a pretty open competition, and I've written about that as another one of my five. Here I am giving them all away <laughs> on, on the podcast, but one of my five battles to watch is Samalu against Alan Barber, and I know how high the Eagles are on him. I know they like the fact that he played center, he played guard, he played right tackle when Vitae got hurt last year against the Ravens and played right. reasonably well. I think the Eagles, given the fact that they invested a third-round pick in him last year, they want to get him on the field. And I think that, again, we talk about guys that are expendable. Jason Kelsey might be expendable via a trade if, say, Amalu steps up. But I think that that's going to be one of those, may the best man win, Barber versus Sayamalu. And I wouldn't bet against Sayamalu stealing that job if he is as good I think he just has to be even with Barber. doesn't even need to be better. If he's as good as Barber, given what they have invested in him, I think he's the guy. So the next the next kind of battle I'm looking forward to, and Doug talked about it a little bit in saying that Jordan Matthews is going to be limited, uh, or at least to start. Um, you mentioned it earlier. Aguilar looked really good in the slot yep. during OTAs. So the question is, if Aguilar, you know, if, if Matthews is healthy and Aguilar, and they're both out there, Who's getting all those reps at the slot? Are they doing a 50-50? Are they putting Nelson on the outside? I think, you know, the Eagles' biggest concern with Nelson is on game day. Can he mentally kind of check in and handle it? But if he looks good in practice, I'll be interested to see how they move him around. Jordan Matthews entering the final year of his deal. 
as we both know, the Eagles genuinely, genuinely, ah, generally, sorry, don't let guys who they like enter the final year of their deal. So that's not a good sign. And for we've him. heard nothing of any sort of contract talks nope. between Matthews and the Eagles or vice versa. Right. And I can tell you that Matthews knee is hurt. Like we, we can talk about, you know, should they hit a training camp? But if, if you want to talk about a main reason not to remember last year, we were both there. Jalen yep. Mills hits Jordan, Jordan Matthews below, below the waist. He suffers the knee injury. He's not been right since then. So, that's one reason not to hit, but that is something to look at going forward. I don't think he has been 100% healthy since then. I don't think he's 100% healthy now. I'd be surprised if he got the chance to get to be 100% healthy during the season. And maybe that's something factoring into the Eagles' decision not to give him that deal. But, you know, again, like politically here we're talking. He doesn't have a he, – he's not – he's a free agent after this year. Aguilar makes is, – is, has two or three years left on his deal at a reasonable rate. Aguilar is a guy that the Eagles should want to succeed because they can keep him. And if he's doing well on the slot, I'll be interested to see how that impacts Jordan Matthews. And I think in today's NFL, slot receivers are a little bit smaller, a little bit quicker. And those are both in terms of, you know, physical traits. Those are things Nelson Aguilar has going for him to be a slot receiver over Matthews. And and yeah, that's why Chip liked Jordan Matthews, because he thought he could beat up on those smaller cornerbacks. And he has done that when, when he's been out there. I mean, his numbers speak for themselves. I know his touchdowns were down a little bit last year, but he's done a good job in the slot. So that's definitely another uh, thing. I, I'm, I'm, it's something that a month ago I wouldn't have thought was a factor. Now I'm thinking, you know, I'll, maybe they do cut his snaps. Right. I'll, I'll say this, that if Jordan Matthews is on this roster, I would bet on him being the slot receiver. But I don't know that I'd bet on him being here because I think that if Aguilar plays as well as he played in the spring and he does it in preseason games, you and I know Elliot just think a couple back years ago in the preseason, Jordy Nelson goes down with green Bay receivers go down. They get hurt during these preseason games and during the summer, Jordan Matthews on the last year of a deal is going to be appealing to a team that suffers an injury at that position because he has experience playing both outside and in the slot. So if, again, if whether it's Sam Allo or Barber, if Aguilar and Matthews are neck and neck, if Matthews is here, I think he's the slot guy, right. but I think that it could facilitate the Eagles feeling better about potentially trading him near that final cutdown day. And so Matthews, I, that is. Right, and I, I agree that besides Wentz, I don't think anybody in this roster is untouchable. For the right price, I think they would move anybody. But I think the reason you just said is why I think there's a good chance Jordan Matthews is going to be here is because receivers do get hurt. And yep. I think the last thing the Eagles want – is to find themselves in week seven. I mean, Alshon has an injury history. Torrey yep. Smith is getting up there. And a PED history with Alshon. Exactly, too, right. So you have to take that into account as so, well. So, you know, to a certain point, yes, if you get offered a third-round pick for Jordan Matthews, I could see why the Eagles would consider it because it's better to get something now than nothing later. But when it comes to Carson Wentz, this team is so clearly not – they so clearly do not want him to be in the same situation as last year with nothing around him. Yep. So, you know, we talked all off season. Maybe they'll move Jason Kelsey. Maybe they'll do this. I think the more the closer we get to week one, this team's goal right now is just to, you know, not that they're win win now, but they're not, they don't have as much of an eye towards the future as we think they do. They're trying to surround Wentz with as much tools as he can to succeed. And by trading Matthews, I think obviously for this year, unless you get a receiver back, clearly you're hurting the receiving core. So I think there's a better chance of Jordan. I think there's an 85 to 90 percent chance Jordan Matthews is here. I agree. I, I, I'm just saying that it's not 100 percent a lock that he won't be traded mm-hmm. if Aguilar steps up and the Eagles are overwhelmed by an offer. And, and, and as far as their philosophy goes, we've talked about this on other podcasts. I think that this off season was all about. Listen, we have this window in Carson Wentz's second year. We know how important that year two is right. to the development of a quarterback. Let's go out and get him veteran weapons. Let's get him with Garrett Blunt, a running back who can be a between-the-tackles bruiser. Yeah. Let's get him two reliable veteran receivers and Alshon Jeffrey and Torrey Smith. They have them on short-term deals, so if they can afford to extend those guys, they can, but it gives – Carson Wentz the chance to develop and improve while next year that's when you draft heavy on the offensive side and get those young playmakers to carry forward the torch with Wentz into the future but as far as this year goes you want to have as much talent around him as possible and I agree with you that trading away Jordan Matthews without an adequate replacement and without getting your socks knocked off as far as the offer goes you're kind of going against your own mission statement there yeah and I mean look you mentioned that talent a lot of it gets here on Thursday so Thursday will be the first full team practice I don't think they'll be hitting on Thursday I'd be very surprised August 1 August 1 is the first day of hitting so that's next week so we'll look forward to that definitely so Thursday, the first full team 
practice. We're going to have a podcast for you again on Thursday after the practice, initial reaction, instant observation type of thing that we're doing right now. And like I said at the beginning of the show, we're going to be doing a lot more of these, you know, three, four times a week, guests, a lot more instant analysis, that type of thing. So, again, to just recap a little bit, you can get us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Google Play, Spreaker, and most importantly, give us a review on iTunes. We want to hear your feedback. Give us five stars, and then you can write a mean comment. But let us know what you want to hear. <laughs> let us know you know, what we can do better. But please give us some feedback on iTunes. We really love the five-star reviews, obviously. So, first day in the books, and uh, I will uh, talk to you on Thursday. Looking forward to it. All right, sounds good. Talk to you guys later.